really was a big thing when we moved in here. The Listowel banner did a three-page spread on us. And you can see here some of the tradespeople that we worked with. And on this page, you see more of the businesses that we dealt with. But because someone had the foresight to put the entire newspaper into our archives, you can also see some of the things that were happening in our community at the time. Al Jerkies was at the lights. MC Smith was still selling appliances. And up here, you'll notice that Mark Crabba was playing defense for the Listwell Jets. I went through the ABM booklet and just developed a timeline for our time here on Tremaine Avenue, picking out some of the um, decisions that we made at, at each annual meeting. You can see some of the things here that were, uh, were important to us at the time. The decision to go wireless with our sound was actually fairly controversial. I can't ima imagine where we had been if we hadn't done that. For about five years in the middle, we ran a second campus out in Ethel. We incorporated in 2005. We talked about building an addition in 2006, actually did it in 2008. In between time, we took a team mission trip to Mexico. In 2011, our original pastor in the building was, uh, left, and Pastor Jeff became our lead pastor. And in 2014, we hired children's workers. And just recently, we've started using uh, the internet to um, put out videos more frequently. I pulled this information out of last year's annual meeting booklet. This is the Missions Corps Ministry annual budget. And I think it's important that even when we were in mission, we supported missions. And since we've been in this building, we've been able to put 10% of our budget towards missions every year. I've highlighted four names here because these are missionaries that went to church here on Tremaine Avenue and they are gifted evangelists. They're also very well-rounded missionaries. Adam Shepsky, who's recently been seconded to Youth for Christ International, can cook. Melissa Drudge, now Shepsky, can upcycle furniture. Melanie Cook-Nickel, who works for Youth for Christ here in Listowel, can lead worship. And Willie Versteeg, who is the French team director in Montreal, can paint and drive a skyjack in two official languages. Ah, and this picture is back in black and white, and it means that we're coming to the end of our series. This gentleman here is C.N. Good, and we've met him before. He was the gentleman in the middle of this picture of the city mission workers, and he was the president of the denomination at the time. Reverend Good came and laid the cornerstone at our church on Davidson Avenue, and he was 94 years old at the time. He preached twice that Sunday, and I found his notes from the sermon, and I think that we'll give him the last word. Your outlook is bright as you look into the future in the midst of a thriving town. You as a people with your pastor caught the vision of a new section of your town and with a larger outlook have made possible the laying of the cornerstone of a larger and more commodious place of worship. The church of which you are a part had its beginning under the direction of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you in this great and glorious work of winning souls for Christ and his kingdom. And may those that come behind us find us as faithful. Amen. Thank you so much, Jenny and Maynard and all who worked hard on that. <laughs> Very interesting, isn't it? Great to see where our history is. And next week we are celebrating 90 years of ministry in the North Perth area of God doing some amazing things. And many of you are here because of the ministry that went on before us at LAMC. And so we want to thank God for that. And kind of the theme for our whole anniversary is passing the torch and remembering that we are not it. It didn't start with us. It started many years ago, 90 years ago. And the torch has been passed faithfully. And so as, as the pastor said in his closing notes that... We want to be found faithful, and we want the generations to come 
to see that we have been faithful. So great, and I'm excited that you are a part of this ministry here. So next Sunday, special Sunday, we are having a coffee house again in the gym. So if you can come early, there'll be lots of goodies. If you can stay late, then please be sure to do that. So we want to encourage you to do that So as we celebrate. And our special guest speaker next Sunday will be President Phil Delso from our EMC denomination. So we're looking forward to having him. And then some other special treats as well going on in our service. So plan to be here for that as we celebrate 90 years. Just want to draw your attention to a few announcements in your bulletin. Craft night, ladies craft night. You can see all the information there about what's taking place on that craft night. Just check it out. And if you need more information, you can contact the office and Laura will be happy to do that. Unite Tonight that's coming up, They're, the date in the bulletin should be the 13th at, the se at 7 p.m., not what it says, so on the 13th is Unite Tonight. And then today, we are taking up a special offering for our capital fund, so we're going to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to pass the plates around in a few minutes to take up that special offering for capital. And some of these projects include switching the lights, the rest of the lights that we have to LED and replacing more of the roof, looking at paving the parking lot, planting some trees, all kinds of stuff for our capital projects. So if you can give and give generously to that, we would encourage you to do so. Christmas blessing coming up. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. If you can take part in that, we're really excited about what God is doing and the opportunity to work there. Now, one of the fruits, there are many fruit from our Christmas blessing, but one of the fruits, if you remember last year, we had a gentleman, he came to our Christmas blessing, and then he became part of our church family, and that is Joseph. Jo Joseph's in the back there, so Joseph, you just wave. Actually, we're going to get you to really, we're going to get you to stand up, because Joseph's has almost been here a year, and also Joseph's got some great news. Don't sit down, Joseph, because we're going to, we want to all look at you. <laughs> Joseph's got some really big news. Joseph's getting married. Yeah. <laughs> so stand up, Eva. Besides, so here is Joseph and his new fiance, Eva. So God bless you guys. We're excited. Now you can sit down. <laughs> but we're excited to celebrate with you coming up. And so praise God. Remember to pray for them as they get ready for this big decision in their lives. So great stuff. Lots of amazing things happening. And uh, Carter, come on up, and then Rosemary, you're going to come up and lead us in prayer. Yeah, I just want to thank you all. Uh, a couple weeks ago, um, you did a uh, pantry shower for us. I forgot what it was called already. Uh, you, did, you did a pantry shower for us, uh, for Kim and I, as we moved here and renew and, and filled our pantry. And you really did fill our pantry. There's no more room. Uh, in our pantry. So we really, 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 really appreciate that. Uh, you guys were incredibly generous. And uh, I, I did take a picture of me uh, laying down beside a castle of all the things that you, you bought for us. And I'll, I'll throw that on the Facebook page this week. But I just, yeah, I just want to thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity and your welcome. And uh, yeah, and for all the stuff you brought to our pantry shower. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you right now for all these wonderful people in this congregation. Lord, I lift them up to you. I thank you so much for being faithful to us, Lord God. I thank you for being our Father who art in heaven. I thank you for giving us everything we need, not everything we want. I thank you, Lord God, that we are here this morning to worship you, to be fed your word, and to reach out to one another. I thank you for your love. I thank you that as I pray, Lord God, our prayers are all going up to the throne room of God, a sweet-smelling incense before you, Lord God that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that there is no one but you, Lord, that can help us deal with our problems, our hurts, and our pains the way you do. And Lord God, 
I pray that we will learn to focus on you and concentrate on you and learn to speak your words out of our hearts. And the only way we can do that, my Father, is by pouring your word into our heart because our heart is a wellspring of your life and your word is life to our bones that we may live a long life upon this earth, I pray. And I thank you, O Lord God, for the answered prayers. For those who have had cancer that have been healed, I thank you for that. And Father God, you have shown me, Lord God, that we are not fighting against one another. We are not fighting a war against flesh and blood, but against all the dark, deep spiritual rulers of the universe in the heavenly realms. And we are up there, Lord God, dressed in your armor, dressed ready for battle. And we bind that enemy, Lord God, as your word says, to go into his territory and bind him. And then we lock him up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And Father God, I thank you for unlocking the windows of heaven and pouring out upon us such abundant blessings for our lives and the lives we touch, Lord God. It is not about us, Lord. It is about you. Father God, thank you for giving me the words to pray that you desire us to grow into your likeness as the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us, as Jesus is the only mediator between us and you, Lord God, that we will not put burdens on each other that we cannot stand up under, I pray. But I pray that we will have the strength to reach out to you when someone comes to us with a need. You are our Father, and you will do your work in us the way you choose to. And Father, I thank you. I glorify you. I praise you. I adore you, Father. And Father God, these people adore you too. They are special and unique and wonderful. They are the apple of your eye, and your favor rests upon them wherever they go. They are blessed in the cities and the countries in their own home. And Father God, I thank you for showering us with your love and protection, Lord God. And you have shown me also to pray a special prayer for those who have really deep hurts and needs. Father God, I isolate those hurts, pains, and needs, and then I surround them with your precious love, your healing power. And Father God, I thank you for touching all of us in special ways through this prayer. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have given me the ability to do this. It's only through you that I can pray for this congregation, as Pastor Jeff has asked me to. And I thank you for your favor that rests upon each and every one of us. Lead, guide, and direct our steps that we will learn to lean on you and not on our own understanding, but uh, on every word that comes out of your mouth, Lord, which is your word to us, your precious, infallible, life-changing, God-empowering word. In Jesus' name, I cover everyone with the precious blood of Jesus and the armor of God. I pray this. Amen. Thank you, Rosemary. You'll also notice in your bulletin there is a special insert, and it is a testimony from Verna Fry. Verna's gone through a challenging uh, time of treatment for cancer, and the last she checked, she is cancer free. Amen. Yeah. So praise God. And so there's a very, uh, a very uh, interesting and a unique uh, thank you and then there's the, the picture on the back that Verna herself did that talks about her healing journey we're gonna invite our ushers this morning to come on up as we take our special capital offering Father, we want to thank you for this place we thank you for this building we thank you for the people who have gone 
and put in so many hours donating time and resources and all kinds of stuff, Lord. And we know that ministry costs money. And to run a building like this, it takes some financial resources. And so, God, we pray that you'll help us to give and to give generously. Give above and beyond. Special, Lord God, for your kingdom, for your glory. So that people continue to hear and learn about Jesus and the love that he has for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, $7 doesn't seem like much nowadays. For $7, I could get two hamburgers. Ah, or I could get two triple venti, sugar-free, non-fat, no-foam, extra caramel macchiatos. Ah, hot, 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 hot. Or I could get two gallons of gas, but that wouldn't get me very far. But I never thought that $7 could connect me to someone on the other side of the world. When I put $7 in a shoebox gift, it helps to send that gift to a child in need. So, for a shoebox going to Mongolia, that's about a thousand miles per dollar. Try getting that kind of mileage out of your hybrid. If I tried to send a shoebox to Mongolia myself, I would spend more than $350, plus the cost of renting a local yak to carry the box up to a village. And what child is going to accept a shoebox from a strange yak? But that shoebox gift could bring the message of the gospel to a child who has never heard of Jesus before. So this year, after you fill your shoebox with toys, don't forget to put $7 in your box to make sure that it gets to that child in need. This year, get involved with Operation Christmas Child. I'm going to invite all our boys and girls to come on up for high voltage. If you're visiting us today, we have a high voltage program. So this is the last week of the month that you, we have been talking in high voltage and at Jube Station. And what has the theme been? It's a C word. It's called... Oh, what was that, Riley? Courage. Courage, right. Courage. Now, who knows the memory verse? Because I'm going to talk about this memory verse with the moms and dads today. So who remembers the memory verse that says, Have I not commanded you be... It just started out really good. <laughs> it started out fast and then it kind of went slow to the very end because wherever you go, now wherever you go, does that mean, remember, if you get in a rocket ship, you go to Mars and you're in a cave and you cover it up with rocks and then obviously the Lord cannot be with you there, right? Because he can't. Oh, he is with you there. Okay, what about if you're in a submarine and you go to the bottom of the ocean and you cover yourself with seaweed and then the sharks are around so that the Lord God cannot be with you there, right? He's always with you? What about when you're in the bathtub? If he's with you in the bathtub, okay, Seth, where is he? Wherever you go. <laughs> Wherever you go, so that means at home, at school, at grandma's house, wherever you go, right? Hudson, God is with you always, and we never want to forget that. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for our boys and girls. 
We love them so much and we appreciate them. And we pray you will bless them, bless their moms and dads, bless the leaders, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said nice and loud. Okay. We'd ask you to stand with us again this morning. We've got a few more songs. The first one we're going to do uh, right now is called Unstoppable God. And it's probably a new song. I don't think we've done it here at LEMC. It's probably new to those of us who are over 32. Um, anyways, it's a good song. It's quite upbeat. So, um, and the, the chorus is very simple. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. And uh, we've heard Verna Fry's testimony this morning, read a little bit about that. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. your glory go on and on. Yeah. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Oh. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Thank 
you, Lord. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have no mercies for me every day Your love never fails You call me out 
upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stay. abounds in deepest waters. Let's sing it together. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Fear may fail and fear surrounds me. You've never
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine, I'm yours, have your way Lord, they so often do, Lord, when our mind wanders and our focus moves so far away from you, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be there when you call, when we call upon your name. And Lord, we know that you're always there, Lord, when we call, when we ask, when we look for you, when we seek, Lord, that we will find you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So talking about taking our feet in different places, we are going to invite Marvin Jane and Pauline come on up now. And Marvin Jane are headed off on an adventure. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing, Marv, and then we're going to lift you guys up in prayer. Anyway, just just very quickly, uh, she she is going to Haiti. She'll be. Uh, we'll get back together here again sometime. Uh, <laughs> just really quickly, we we've been there. I was asking her, and she reminded me we've been there four other times. And we um, we go with Marilyn McElroy, who has been here before, talking to our congregation, sharing some uh, uh, things about work that she does and and missions work with uh, with our denomination. Um, this trip was planned before the hurricane, and uh, it really didn't intend to have anything to do with that. That's going to be a, a different challenge, and um, Marilyn has us taking some extra medication and things for hurricane relief, so there'll be things like that going on. Uh, we're leaving next Saturday and back on the 15th of, of November. Uh, so basically, that's the, the short part of it. I guess as prayer concerns, uh, really not sure what we'll find there. Uh, the part of the country that we're going to be in is the northeast part of just across the border from Dominican Republic, actually. Uh, so it may have survived better, certainly survived better than the south, southern part, the southern peninsula. Uh, but they've had a lot of rain. And I keep saying to people, we, we have river crossings that we do to get to the village that we go to. And uh, those are not good at the best of times. So I'm not sure what that will be like now, but that's one prayer concern anyway. Okay. Um, just before we pray for Marv and Jane, um, just a, a thank you to those people who came out to the nodding party and, the, and the, those um, milk mats as well. So the nodding party, they had, I think they made nine quilts. Is that right, Verna? Eight? Six this time six this time, and then three mats. So they're going off to Africa, and the quilts are going to the refugees. Is that right, Verna? Yes, I think that's a thumbs up. So there we go, thank you very much. So we don't necessarily have to go far, far away to serve our Lord, but also close by. And then the shipping happens. So we just have to be thankful for all your willing hands at, at any time. And I just want to play one little plug. One thing Marvin Jane shared with us was this might be your last time going to Haiti. Okay. That could, that could <laughs> it could be. They're not exactly sure. But do you know what? Whenever we think, oh, that, that mission has stopped, it really hasn't. I'm hoping we plant a seed today. You never know what, what might happen today. Maybe someone might say, hey, Haiti's got, coming into my heart. So we're just um, You might have more people on the trip with you next time if you, do, if you do decide to go. So we're just so thankful for you going. And let us all pray together. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Marv and Jane and for their hearts for Jesus and for the willingness to go and share Jesus in Haiti. We just ask you to please be with them. 
be with them on the trip and over those bumpy roads. Please, any barrier that comes in their way, may you be there to tear it down so that uh, your news is spread in Haiti. And we know that they have been preparing for this for a very long time. Jane has so many crafts and things prepared for the children. We just ask that all those activities um, that they uh, do with the children, that they, the children come to know you as Savior. And that's the whole thing. The whole trip here is for that your name be praised. And we're just so thankful that um, Jane and Marv are going to be going to Haiti. We just ask that you be with them and um, be with them the whole time, in the good times and the bad. We just ask that your whole blessing be poured upon this trip. We just ask for their safety there and back again. And we just uh, pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pauline. When I was a kid, every Saturday morning was something that I looked forward to with great excitement because it was the one day in our family that we could watch cartoons without my dad around. But we had to do it very quietly because he was sleeping upstairs. And if you were too loud, then he would come and holler at us and make us turn off the TV. But one of the TV shows that I looked forward to so much was Spider-Man and Friends. I don't know if you're familiar with Spider-Man and Friends. Yeah, okay. So who were his friends? It was Iceman and Firestar and Spider-Man. But Spider-Man, he was ultimately my favorite. And I could relate to Spider-Man because I just thought he was amazing, because he, he was the amazing Spider-Man. And if I could have chosen any superhero to be in my whole life, it would have been, and probably still is, Spider-Man. And, uh, and I like a lot of superheroes, but he was, he was my favorite. And I used to wish that somehow I could get bitten by a radioactive spider and become another Spider-Man, maybe a Spider-Boy or something, you know. Not, I wouldn't be the Spider-Man, but you know, an offshoot of Spider-Man. Because I wanted to be a superhero. And you, you just see these guys on TV, and they rush in with, you know, just carefree. They are bold. They are courageous. They save the day, and it is fantastic being a superhero. But the reality is, I'm not a superhero. And the even worse reality is, and the simple fact is, that none of us ever will be superheroes. I will never be bitten by a radioactive spider, even though I look high and low for one, you, you search on the internet, you can buy some cheap knockoffs, but I don't really think they will do it. They're just, they're just fake, just like the holy water that you sprinkle on you for healing. No, it's not going to happen. So in spite of all of these things, I know that God says, you may not be a Spider-Man, but he has called us and called each of us and me to do some heroic things, and even though they may be scary. I came across a story this week. It's about a little girl, five-year-old Jocelyn. She was playing in her grandmother's front yard, and a man drove up in his car, and he was talking to her, and he was saying, oh, I really like your bike, and she had a conversation with him. He opens the door, he grabs the little girl, and he pulls her into his car, and he drives off. Now, this was, you can just imagine the horror and the panic. The grandmother quickly calls the police. They don't know who this guy was. And the police come. They start to distribute photos of the little girl all over. And this one boy, 15-year-old kid, Tamar Boggs, he saw the photo and something in him said, I'm going to be the one to find this girl. And so he got one of his friends and he said, come on, we got to do something. He borrowed a friend's bike. They, both of them, they took off in their bikes around their neighborhood. This was a, a well-off neighborhood and they were just looking. They didn't know what they were looking for, but they just knew that they had to go out and they had to, they had to look. And they saw this suspicious looking maroon car and they drove up behind it. And, they, and it was, as it was weaving through this, this um, inner, the section of town, and um, Tamar made eye contact with the guy, and he saw in the back seat there was a little girl with blonde hair sitting there. And he said, this is the kid. And so they followed, as hard as they could pedal, they followed this car, and finally, I guess the car got freaked out, he got spooked, he pulled over to the side of the road, and he let the little girl out. Tamar rode up on his bike, and the little girl saw him, and she ran and jumped into his arms, and all she could say was, I want my mommy. 
He took her back to his mother, and tomorrow, Tamar became a hero that day. They, they later found out that the, the, the police identified the man as a 63-year-old man, and he, had, he was a convicted offender. And so Tamar, when he was questioned, he says, I wasn't thinking about bravery. That wasn't the reason I did this. And his mother exclaims, you could have been hurt. Something could have happened to you and by, by taking this risk. And Tamar responded back to her. He says, what would you have done for me, mom? He says, I know you wouldn't have stopped until you found me. I didn't do it for attention. I just wanted to help. Everyday heroes. Everyday heroes, and that's what I believe God calls us to be. Everyday heroes are the best thing, and they're cool because we can all be an everyday hero. Simple ways. Look for opportunities to compliment somebody. Hey, you look great today. You did a great job. I love the worship music today. Excellent work on this. That, just simple compliments. Hold a door or an elevator. Simple thing like that. How rare is that in our society today? When somebody, and we teach our children to hold the doors for people and not just run in and have them slam in somebody's face or hold the elevator. And it's a simple thing like that. Let someone go ahead of you in line or at our or, or traffic. Yeah, I don't know if you've been driving in the city of Kitchener lately with all this uh, uh, construction going on and you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait and you just pray that somebody will let you in and somebody stops and waves it and you go, yes. Yes, that is an everyday hero. Simple, something simple like that. Uh, and like a small charity or, or a Facebook page just to show your support, just to encourage them. Text somebody and just let them know that you care. Thinking about you today. You don't have to write a big thing. Just a simple little, hey, I was thinking about you today. I just wanted to say hi and let you know I'm, I'm thinking about you. Motivate others to pursue their ideas. Just tell, you got an idea, run with it, go for it. Yeah, just do it. And learn the names of people and greet them by name and smile. How many people are in this church that people say, I didn't even know they came to this church. I think they're new. Uh, actually, they're not. They've been coming here for three years. And, and so it, it's, it might take us a little bit of, um, out of our comfort zone to maybe not sit in your favorite spot, but move over here and see, wow, there are other people in this church. That's really, really neat. And then actually go the next step and learn their names. And then sincerely listen to someone and don't interrupt and don't suggest a solution, but just listen. Just be there and just say, and don't say anything, but just, just show your presence and show your care. Those are really practical ways. And there's hundreds of thousands of, them of ways of being an everyday hero. This is the best kind of hero. And, but for some of us, the most smallest, the smallest, the most, the most tiny you know, heroic deed is often hindered by fear, isn't it? Well, I would, but I just, I fear that they'll reject me. I'm afraid how will they respond or I'm afraid what will happen. And so we stop doing things because we are afraid. And so every opportunity needs a measure of courage. Now, courage, courage is what we've been talking about with our kids this month. And courage, courage is being brave enough to, know, to do what you know you should do, even when you are afraid. So you know you do what is right, even when you're afraid. Mark Twain, he wrote this about courage. He said, courage is, is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not the absence of fear. And then another quote that I read it says, courage is not the absence of fear, but triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Amen? And one of the most difficult things we will ever learn to overcome is fear. And, and, and it, it's, it's unrealistic expect, to expect people to become completely fearless. And that is why our goal as leaders and as teachers and as parents and as people in general working with people is to help people to understand so that they will not become paralyzed by their fears, but learn how to face them and learn how to master them. Because we know there's some things about fear. And one of those is that fear is crippling. It kind of cripples you up. When you want to do something, you're just terrified. You're scared. And it just, oh, and it, and it kind of cripples you. Fear is debilitating. A little while ago, Ainsley Stanley talked about being on the, at the CN Tower and mastering your fear by walking over the glass plate. And, and it, you could just stand there terrified, um, and you're, you're debilitated. 
And we've been in those situations where you just, I can't move. I am so afraid. Fear holds us back. You want to do something, but you're afraid what the outcome will be. I don't know. I don't know how it'll turn out. And it holds us back from doing the things that we want to do or we could do. And then fear keeps us from our full potential. There are things that you want to do in your life, but you say, oh, I could never do that. There's no way that I could ever do that. I, I don't have the money. I don't have the smarts. I don't have the, you know, I don't have the strength. We don't, I don't have the know-how. And it's just like, yeah, and so fear holds you back from doing the things that God has called you to do. 2 Timothy 1.7, and we know this verse. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. And one of the big reasons he put sound mind in there, sound mind is we need clarity, we need thinking, clear, clarity of thinking and, and self-control because you know what happens when you become afraid? All of a sudden your mind goes all cluttered and, and you just are focused. And God says, no, I didn't give you a, a cluttered mind, but I give you a clear mind, a sound mind. And then this verse that the kids learn, and one of my favorite verses is Joshua 1.9. He says, have I not commanded you, be strong and be courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, in context, when you think about the words, these words were spoken to Joshua. Joshua had been under the leadership of Moses, the greatest man who ever lived, the Bible says. He was an incredible leader. And so Moses, he passes away, and he hands, hands the mantle of leadership to Joshua. Can you imagine that? You are, you are under this great leader, and suddenly you are the one that the two million people are going to be following, two million plus people that, that, the, 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 that Moses was in charge of. And so God says to him three times in chapter 1, and then once in chapter 10, be strong and be courageous. And he tells him, be strong and be, and he's not talking about physical strength. He didn't say go to the gym and work out so you can really be buff and you can fight the enemy. He's talking about strength of character, strength of mind. You got to be strong and resolved and you got to have courage. And oftentimes as a leader, if you've been in any type of leadership position at all, inside the leader is often the scaredest one of the bunch. Amen? Isn't it so true? And whether you are a, a, a church leader or a business, you're running your own company, whether you are a fam, uh, the leader of your family or the head of your home, you're a parent, oftentimes we are scared to death, but we know we got to lead. I know when, I remember once when we went on a family holiday. And uh, Bailey was just a baby, and Sue and I, we went out east, and we had the dog with us, and we, and we drove, and we were staying in this motel. Our first stop was in this sketchy little motel, and it was in a really, like, sketchy neighborhood, and we heard all, you know, partying going on, and, and all kinds of, you know, questionable people walking around, and my heart was thumping, and, and I, was, I was terrified, but I was the father, I was, the, I was the leader. I was the dad. I, I didn't say to my wife, honey, you go in and get us checked in, and I'll, and I'll quick meet you in at the backside door. And it's like I knew I had to take a step. I had to be strong, and I had to be courageous because I was the leader of my family. And I had to be the one to go in and, and face those fears, and we made it through the night. But, but it wasn't without some fear and trembling. And so oftentimes as leaders, we know we have to go forth and we have to be the ones to be strong and people are following and they, they're just trusting us to be the leaders. And, and so folks, don't ever forget that leaders are people too and they are often need, need our encouragement and, and prayers and, and there's some fear there. And so this month, talking about being brave enough to know what you need to do even though you are afraid. And so the first story that was looked at was in the beginning when Moses, remember Moses was born and Pharaoh was in a really nasty spot. He was just disgusted with the Israelites. The Israelites were, were they were just prospering and they were growing and their numbers were just, God was just blessing them numerically and the population was just out of control. And so he was going to put an end to this and he was going to have all of the children, he was going to have them killed. And if you remember the mother of Moses, 
She says, uh, this can't be. So she took Moses. She hid him away for three months. If you've had a brand newborn, and you can just imagine trying to keep that baby hidden and quiet for three months. And so finally, she knew it couldn't be done anymore. She, you remember the story. She makes the basket, covers it with pitch, puts him in there, and then she sets him in the Nile River and lets him go, praying, just God, go with him. Now imagine, just imagine the, the reality of that story placing your baby in that river and not knowing what is going to happen to him. And the point we get from that is that we have to be brave enough to do what has to be done even though you don't know what will happen next. You got to do what you have to do even though you will never know what will happen next. And most of us, there are times of fear when we don't know what the future is going to hold. You don't know what's going to happen. If you make this decision, if you make this business decision, if you, if you step out in this area, what's going to happen next? And like Moses' mother, you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen next, but you have to have courage. You have to take that step, and you have to leave it with God, and you have to trust him. Then we see later on. Moses, he made it. You know the story. The Pharaoh's uh, daughter finds Moses and she takes him into the household and she makes him into her own child and makes him a leader. And lots of things happen in Moses' life and then he ends up being banished and he, he takes off. And then you remember the story of Moses on the mountain and he sees the burning bush. And then God calls him and he says, Moses, I have a plan for you. He says, Moses, I want you to go, I want you to go down to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, set my people free. Now, Moses, if you remember the story in, in the book of Exodus, Moses, he just came up with excuse after excuse after excuse. And he didn't want to do what God was calling him to do. And so he fought that. And in the end, God finally says, Moses, you're going to do it. And he, he gives in and he says, okay, God, I'll do it. And God sends Aaron along with him to be his voice. And we learn from Moses there is that you can do what you should do even when you don't feel ready. Even when you don't feel ready. Here we got Moses. He did not feel qualified. He did not feel ready for this task. Here it was set upon him, and he's going, God, there's got to be somebody else. There's got to be somebody else that's smarter than me. There's got to be somebody else that's more qualified, a better speaker. Remember, Moses says, hey, I'm not eloquent. I don't, have, I don't have the gift of speech. I'm not good with my tongue. And, and some scholars believe that he had a speech impediment, and he didn't, he didn't speak very well. But he, he's just thinking, there's got to be somebody else. And God sends somebody else to do this. And God says, no, I want you. I want you. And I believe he did that for one reason, and, and for many reasons, but one of those reasons is to show us here and today that God uses everyday people with flaws and people who are not maybe talented or gifted or whatever ways that we think we should be. And God says, you know what? Yeah, there are different people that I could call, but I've chosen you. You are the one that I want to do this. And so he's calling them. And so we will face times in our lives, if you haven't already, and you will face times in your life when you don't feel qualified. You don't feel that you were the one that should be doing I don't feel ready for this. God, I don't feel ready. And God says, you need courage. You need courage to go ahead and do this. And then we see later on that Moses did go on a little later on. And Ryan, are we not working there or is it frozen up? Okay, there we go. So then we see later on that God, back, 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 back. One more back. The red, the red Sea. There we go. No, one more the Red Sea. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> Moses comes to the Red Sea. Look for the picture of Moses in the Red Sea. Moses comes to the Red Sea. <laughs> and Moses, there we go. 
And Moses comes out, he's got millions of people behind him. They're all counting it. Can you just imagine the pressure of this guy, this leader? And people are trying to overtake him. People are trying to usurp his authority. People are grumbling, complaining all the time. He's having to go to God, and God is saying, I'm going to wipe these people out. Moses is having to speak on their behalf and saying, no, no, God, don't do that. It'll make the Egyptians right. And all of these things. And Moses, I cannot even imagine the pressure on this guy. So they come to the Red Sea, and there are all these people behind them saying, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And then they, they get the report that Pharaoh's army is coming to get them. Pharaoh's army is going to come and get them, probably wipe them out, and, and take the rest back to Egypt with them. And so Moses is just saying, okay, God, here we are. You've led us this far. And you know what Scripture says? It says he held his staff over the Red Sea, and then the waters parted. And they walked across on dry land. And then when they got to the other side, Pharaoh and his army came in. And remember that incredible, incredible situation. And then the waters came in and it destroyed Pharaoh and all of his armies. And so we learn something really, really important that God calls us sometimes to do the impossible, right? And I've, and I've encouraged you to do that some, once before and just, just pray for that impossible person in your life. Who is that person that you would just think, it's impossible. My dad would never come to Christ. My neighbor, oh my goodness, that guy has got such a potty mouth. I have, he would never come to church. This person, they would never even smile at me, much less um, be open to a conversation about God. And so I encourage you, pray for that impossible person in your life. Who is that? And make that your mission and say, God, this is the impossible person in my life. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for an opportunity because we know that with God, all things are what? Possible. And so Moses comes to this situation and God proved himself and there will be impossible situations in your life. And you will look at that. Verna just came across an impossible situation and and she said, there's nothing I can do. Uh, this is it. I, I have come to this position in my life. I am at the mercy of God. And God does miracles. And we know sometimes God chooses to do things differently. But we want to appeal to him and say, God, this is impossible. And I want to come before you and do that. And so we know that God can do impossible things. And we need to have courage even there. And then there was the story of Moses and they come to the promised land, and they send in spies. You know, that I love this story too. Joshua and Caleb, they, they, they go into the, the promised land with 10 other people, and they are there, and they are scouting out the land, and they come back, and Moses says, well, how was it? And they get, out of 12 people, they get a report from 10 people, there's no way we can do it. There's absolutely no way. And I love, and I'll just read what it says in Numbers chapter uh, 13 verse 30, it says, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Don't you love Caleb? I love that. The Bible says that he is of a different spirit. And that's why when we had our firstborn boy, firstborn boy we said we're going to call him Caleb because he's going to be of a different spirit. And he is definitely chosen, proven to be so. And so... <laughs> But he's going to be of a different spirit. And I love how Caleb says that we can certainly do it. Ten other people are saying it can't be done. But Caleb says we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone with him said we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. And they said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. And we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked on, and and to them we looked the same. And Joshua and Caleb, they both said, if God is for us, we can do this. We can do this. And so only two out of the 12 took a stand. And they, they said that we are going to go forth and they conquered the land. And they were the only two men from their generation to see the promised land that Abraham had, had that God had told, told Abraham that they would see because they were the ones who were faithful. And so the bottom line is that you can do whatever it is you need to do. You can have courage to do even when others are afraid. There are going to be people in your life who will tell you it can't be done. It can't be done. 
There's no way you can do this. There's no way that, that this can happen. Your dream here, it's kind of a nice thing, but it's a bit of a pipe dream. And you're not, it's not ever going to come to fruit. And there will be people in your life who will, will, will just kind of squash you down and, and they will pour a bucket of cold water on your, on your dreams and on the things that God has called you to do. But when others are afraid, you're going to have to take that stand and you're going to have to trust him and say, you know what, even though others say it can't be done, I'm going to go for it because I believe that God has called me to do this and I'm going to do it. And then lastly, you may be familiar with the story of Joshua, the famous battle in Jericho. God promised Abraham that he would receive the land of Canaan. And Joshua in chapter 5 and 6 we read that the Israelites, they took their first steps towards fulfilling this promise. And if you remember, the, the, the city was just surrounded by a great wall. And God told Joshua, he said, I want you to do something. He said, I want you to march around that city for seven days. And then on the last day, on the seventh day, I want you to march around that city seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you to, and what did he ask him to do? Shout. I want you to shout. Just shout and yell as loud as you can. Now, seriously, folks, doesn't that sound like the most ridiculous thing ever? Like we would say, uh, and when, when you march around that seven times, I want the armies to just storm that wall and break it down. But he says, no, I want you to shout. I want you to shout. It seemed like this ridiculous thing. And you can just picture people going, is this what we're seriously doing today? Like is Joshua, do you think Joshua's really hearing from God? Like, uh, okay, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling kind of embarrassed here. All these people are looking at us over there. They were probably mocking them, laughing at them. They could have been taunting them. Who knows what was happening and going on, but they were faithful. God called them to do something really strange, something really outrageous. And Joshua, he was obedient. He was obedient to what God had called them to do. They marched around for seven days. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times, and then they shouted. They shouted for all they were worth. And if you remember what the Bible, the story says, is that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. And they took, they took the city. And it wasn't because of them. God was showing them once again, it's not by, by, um, by our might or our strength, but it's by God's power. It's by, the, by his spirit, says the Lord. And so God was showing them. And this is an encouragement to us today. Maybe God is asking you to go through something really silly or a challenge or a difficult time in your life and you're saying, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why is this going on? And God is just saying, just do it. Just be obedient. Have faith, be obedient, and then go through what you gotta go through. And then at the end, just, just, just shout that shout of praise and that, and that shout of, of glory to God. And so... All the best heroes are ordinary people. Amen? I love the story. That's, why, that's what the, the Bible is all about, ordinary, everyday people. People who were messed up. People who had major hang-ups. People who were not qualified to be the heroes of God. But God chose them, and he chose them to show us today that every one of us, ordinary people, we're heroes and God takes us and makes us extraordinary because life can be scary. It will sneak up on you and it will hit you when you least expect it. And I remember as a kid, I hated going to bed because I had, I had older brothers. And there were three bedrooms upstairs, and it was a, a two-story house, and at the top of the stairs, there was this landing. And the landing was big enough for a bunk bed, and that was my room on the landing, in the bunk bed. And so my brothers, being the wonderful brothers that they were, I just never knew when I was going to walk upstairs and go into the bathroom and someone was going to jump out at me. And so I was always a, uh, always a little scared going up to bed. And my brother, my one brother was really good because he would go in his room, he would turn the light on, and he would turn the music on. And I would think, okay, good, it's safe. And I would go into the bathroom, and I'd look around the corner, but he wouldn't be around that corner. He'd be hiding around another corner. And he, he would get me inevitably. And so, uh, so then I started to say, okay, 
I need to um, be a little more proactive. And so, so as a kid, you, you start to learn. You, that happens to you a few times, and so you start to get proactive, and you start to carry a stick with you. <laughs> or you start to carry a shoe, or you start to do something, and you don't even know if something's there, but as soon as you go in, you just go, wah, boom! And it's like, and if he was there, he was going to get it. If he wasn't, then you came. Either way, you got it. But we know that things are going to hit us. And we have to start to be proactive and see, okay, I know things are going to happen in my life. I know challenges are going to happen. Things are going to jump out at me. And, and I can either sit at the bottom of the stairs and sleep on the floor, or I can say, you know what? No, I'm going to show that guy what for, and I'm going to d- d- face him, and I'm going to get into my bed and, and know that I feel good about the fact that I face my fears. And so fear only has power over us when we don't face it. And so sometimes we need to face our fear. And I don't know what it is that is your fear this morning. What it is this morning that God is saying to you, have I not commanded you? Be strong, be courageous, do not be terrified. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you, what's it say? Wherever you go. And that is something we, we really wanted to emphasize with the children in our, kids, in our kids program. And I want to emphasize that with you this morning. Wherever you go, there is no place that God is not with you wherever you go. We're going to close off in prayer. And the worship team is going to just uh, sing that closing song again about... Um, <clears throat> about the unstoppable God. We're going to pray, and then if you want to stay behind and sing, then we want to invite you to do so. But uh, we just want to usher you out with some, some worship music. But let's take a moment to pray. Father, I want to thank you for just being the unstoppable God. And Lord, I just, I just love it that you use unsung heroes. You use ordinary people to be heroes. And God, that sets the example for us that we need to have courage and we need to be strong because you have called us, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you will be with each and every one here this morning. You know the struggle. You know the fear. You know the, you know the thing that is holding them back from the full potential that you have called them. And Jesus, we pray that you will help us to have the courage and the strength to face that fear, to look that fear straight in the eye and say, in the name of Jesus, I can overcome you. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. I pray for each one. I pray that you will help us, God, to be strong and courageous. Help us to remember that you are with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. And uh, just remember, face those fears. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded and the mountains. your glory go on and on impossible things in your name they shall be done freedom conquered all our chains undone sin defeated Jesus has over trials when the third day dawned darkness was denied when the storm was gone unstoppable God let your glory go on and on impossible things in your Things in your name, they 
shall be done. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. We'll shout to the impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be Shout your praise forevermore, Jesus, our God unstoppable. Unstoppable God, let your glory go.